Hey, I hope you guys can hear me. So uh, this talk is going to be about the product matching problem. Uh, this problem is something that me and my team uh, have been working for for about uh, one, one and a half year now. It's a problem that's uh, very easy to describe, very impactful, and incredibly hard to solve. And uh, we have made some progress, good progress here. And uh, the, the idea is to talk about the problem, why it's important, and uh, how we solved it, and the learnings along the way. Right. So let me start by uh, talking a bit about index. It's best to understand what index does uh, using this, this analogy. Right. So what Facebook is for people, uh, Google Maps is for locations. Index is for products. What do I mean by that? So basically, we are trying to organize, analyze, visualize all the product information in the world and make it available so that everybody can act on it. What this includes is data collection, going from unstructured data to structured data, analytics on this data, visualization, and personalization and surfacing the data. Right? So to give you a perspective on where we are at today, we are on our way to building the world's largest product database. What do I mean by large? We have 700 million products. We have 40K brands, 7K and more categories, about 10K plus attributes. So that's where we are at. And uh, we will soon cross the billion mark, which would be very, very interesting. OK, so that's about index. Let me just jump into the product matching problem. As I said, it's a problem that is very easy to describe and very hard to solve. This is a shoe at five different retail sites. It's the same shoe. These are variants. So the product matching problem is simply to say that these five products are actually the same product. That's the problem. right? Now, to make this problem a little more concrete, uh, I'm going to introduce some details. Let's just assume that I have a crawler, and I have crawled a bunch of product pages. Let's say about a billion, not too much, a billion. And the idea is for uh, this matching process is to produce a set of URLs or a group of URLs such that the two products, two URLs in a group, are actually the same product. Right? So this block right here is the focus of the talk. And this is you know, a very intuitive uh, description of the problem. So before we uh, you know, try to solve the problem, let's, let's get a sense of why uh, it's, it's uh, worth solving. I mean, what, what is the value add? What is the business impact? So the way uh, we look at it, the product matching problem is central to almost all problems in retail analytics. The reason is, if you start with questions like, who are your competitors? What prices are they selling the products you carry for? What are the products that you should carry that they are carrying right now? What are the products that they don't carry and you carry, and you can promote them? So those are some of the questions that you would want to answer. And in order to answer these problems well, what you need to be able to do is to be able to match products across stores. So if you look at this diagram here, I mean, it's a very abstract view of what, what we are trying to do. Uh, these are products, and I'm just trying to put or learn or induce these links across products. Scale matters in the sense that for this information to be useful, you need to have as many products as possible. You need to have as many sites as possible. You need to have coverage in a particular category. So those are the dimensions of scale. And you have to get them right if you are to you know, generate insights over 
the data. So this is just uh, you know uh, our app, uh, and it, it's just showing pricing comparisons for a particular product, right? But that's just one piece of uh, the pie that you can have when you actually solve this problem well. So that's the problem, and that's the impact of the problem. We'll now start looking at uh, how can we solve this problem. And there are multiple sub-problems here. There are many moving parts. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with each of these parts piecemeal, detail them, and towards the end of the talk, they'll all fall in together. So let's start with the first problem, which is parsing. What is the problem? I have an HTML page, and I need to extract key attributes, such as titles, image URLs, prices, descriptions, spec text, from the product page. I cannot handwrite parsers. They'll be very hard to maintain at this scale. I need something that works in an automated way. I can develop tools, but it's not going to scale. I need something that works in an automated way. So let's try to look at it from a machine learning standpoint. Right? How can I model this problem? Well, one way to look at this problem is, what is the HTML page? It's a DOM tree. And every node here is either a title or not. So if I am able to formulate this as a binary classification problem, do good feature engineering for each of these DOM nodes, train a binary classifier, which tells me whether it's a title or not, and I'll train binary classifiers for descriptions, image URLs, pretty much everything I need. I could attack this problem. right? I could attack this problem in a very uh, principle-oriented as well as a, a scalable kind of a way. Right? Why do I think this might work? I mean, well, wh what, is, what is the intuition here? So the intuition that I began with was if somebody showed me a, 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 a Chinese uh, retail site, I, I don't speak Chinese, I mean Mandarin, that is, uh, but I am able to identify the title, I'm able to identify the image, I'm able to identify the price. Why? Because this is about structure. It's not about content, it's about structure. And if we can do feature engineering well, this problem can be solved. That was the hypothesis, right? Well. Turned out, it does work. But there are a fair amount of uh, details to take into consideration. And this is the first learning, that feature engineering is key. More than the algorithm, the feature engineering, at least in this partic for this particular problem, was key to getting this problem right. Now, let's look at what kind of features just to uh, get a sense for what kind of uh, things are being extracted. I mean, that's the title. This is the variant information. That's the description. That's the image. These are uh, additional images, right? That's the price. So there are two kinds of features, or two families of features that I can extract for each of these DOM nodes. The first one is features that I get from the HTML. That's the DOM tree. You can think of it as a tree. So what are the parents of this particular vertex? What are their tags? How far away are they from the root? How many children do they have? How many children do their siblings have? What are their tags? There was a massive, massive feature engineering exercise. And that got us far. But we didn't get there totally. What were we missing? What we were missing is, we don't see a page as the DOM. We see it uh, visually, right? It's, 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 it's an image. So what we started doing is, we started rendering the page in a headless browser, like found in PhantomJS, and that allowed us to get a set of visual features. What do I mean by visual features? I have x and y coordinates of this DOM node after it's rendered. I can extract features about the color contrast. You'll notice that the price is the highest contrast on the page, often, often, right? I, I, I don't know whether that's a design thing. It's just something that we have looked, I mean, noticed in data. So with 
a bunch of these image feature, HTML features and these visual features, we were able to train uh, classification models that allowed us to solve this problem fairly well. Now, there is, there is a problem here. The problem is that the visual features require you to render the whole page. That's pretty expensive. So we don't do it everywhere. We do it for the complicated sites. Where the HTML features work, we just use those. Right? So that's, that's how we attacked the problem and uh, solved it, I would say, fairly well. Uh, I mean, there is still room for improvement. There is still room for uh, more feature engineering. There is still room for getting more data. An interesting thing that you can do is build a classifier based on these features, have them generate data, and use that label data to train this guy. That works, because you need a lot of label data for it. And there are limits to how much budgets you have on crowdsourcing. So that's the parsing problem. OK. So moving on. The second important problem that you need to solve is that of product classification. It's a very simple problem again. It's the what is it question. What is that? It's a laptop. That's it. What human beings can do very easily, it's hard for algorithms and machines to do. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to look at all this extracted data that you have from the parser and go to a category. This category is typically a leaf node in a taxonomy. This taxonomy needs to be very specific in order for you to do a good job at matching. Any guesses as to why these two products might be confused with each other? They're both pumps. I've learned a lot about women's shoes over the past one and a half year, more than my wife would like, which is interesting. But yes, this is a pump shoe, and that's an actual pump. And if you're just building a classifier based on titles, and if pumps has a very high uh, token weight, you might get this wrong, right? So yeah, this is a challenging problem. And the key learning here was using ensembles. You cannot just use one class of data to solve this problem. What you need is a battery of approaches and a good ensemble in order to solve this problem. What are the different approaches? Let's start with the simplest one, which is the breadcrumb mapping. Data on retail websites, at least the classification, can be wrong sometimes. But it is still good. But people have different taxonomies. But if you can map them offline, you can use that information as one of the signals. You can train classifiers, we use linear support vector machines, on titles and descriptions, mostly text data. You can use a CNN on the image. You can also introduce background knowledge. Now, MSC Direct would not carry women's shoes. MSC Direct is a major industrial supply retail outlet in the US, right? So you can, you can make a certain assumptions, or you can introduce certain features that capture your background knowledge, that certain classes of products will not be available in certain sites. Right? So again, this was a massive feature engineering exercise. It was a massive uh, ensembling exercise. But finally, we got to a point wherein we had reasonable accuracy enough to, to, to make progress on this problem. And again, I like to stress the use of ensembles and not sticking to just one particular source of data. There are a few interesting things that you can do here, again, wherein you can crawl these images or get procure these images offline and then train models and not use the classification online if it pretty much dominates over the text classification. So it's important to note the balance that everything associated with images, including procuring the data, training the models, is going to be expensive. But it's, it's, it's resources well spent. Moving on. The next important problem is attribute extraction. Here, what you're trying to do is you're trying to go from all this information that you extracted with the parser and you're using a predefined schema to get attributes like brand, size, color, packs, so on and so forth. Without getting this right, you're never going to get the product matching problem right. 
And the schema tends to be very large. It tends to be category specific. If you have classification errors, they're going to bleed into these errors. It's going to be a cascade. And it, that is going to be very hard to solve. So it's important to get classification right. And it's also important to get the parsing right. right? So it's, it's like a pipeline where an error cascades. So that's what happens in attribute extraction. right? Uh, there are a large number of attributes. There is bad and missing data. There is you know, a lot of challenges there. So, so just, just to give a sense of why, I mean, these are both training shoes. One is from Nike, one is from Reebok. And if you don't have the brand right, you could still use the images. That will get pretty expensive. But it helps to uh, get the model that extracts the brands right in order to solve the problem. right? So we mostly use CRFs for this. Uh, typically, we are trying to extract. So for example, a rubber sole. So that's a sole being rubber, brand being Nike. Uh, colors can be pretty absurd sometimes. That's the color of the shoe. It's pretty weird, but whatever. I mean, the point is, you have to uh, go ahead and define your schema, train models on each of these uh, pieces of uh, text that you have uh, to you know, extract the attributes that matter for matching. Right? So that's, that's the next problem. Now, fine. I mean, you're at a point wherein you can actually start attacking the problem. You have the original data that you started with that was parsed. You have the classification category. And you have your attributes. We refer to this as an enriched product record. It's a product record with all the information. So I guess one way of uh, attacking the problem is to say, I'm just going to come up with a distance metric, and I'm going to do you know, an all pairs on these products. And if that uh, distance is small, I'm just going to say that's a match. It's a pretty reasonable approach. The problem is, with our scale, it would take roughly around 18 years to do that. Uh, N-square doesn't work. N-square doesn't work in the sense that at this uh, scale, e e even if, so this, I mean, I made the assumption that uh, the particular uh, pairwise matching would take a nanosecond, and then it's 18 years. I guess our funding would run out pretty soon. Uh, I mean, you know, it not last for 18 years. So we had to do this faster, right? But, there are, you know, it's, 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 it's not a big deal uh, in the sense that you have all the information that you can use in order to, uh, you know, do this, I mean, solve this problem better. What you want to do is block on a bunch of things that uh, will take your products and put them into groups such that the probability of any two products being the same is high. So this, this step is essential. You can do blocking in many different ways. You can say, my classification and brand extraction is really good. I trust it. Which is why I'm going to put all the products that belong to a certain brand and a certain category in one partition. It's a simplistic approach. Depends on how much you trust your classification. Depends on what particular level in the taxonomy uh, you, you, you want to block at. So you might say, my leaf level accuracy isn't good enough, but one level above that, I'm good. Let me block at that level. So that's, that's one way. And you can take different approaches for different top level categories. right? The other two approaches are basically based on string similarity join and hashing. Uh, the key here is no one approach, again, works you're not going to be able to take one particular way uh, to do blocking and extract or get good recall on your matches. You're going to have to try different approaches. And then you're going to have to merge these groups to get the final set of groups on which you can you know, do a pairwise inference. So the learning here is one doesn't work. Again, this is uh, an ensemble, but I won't call it that because that's more from a classification uh, you know, terminology as such. OK, so now you have these groups. And what you need to do is uh, simply do a pairwise computation, right? a pairwise distance computation. 
Again, that would require a fair amount of feature engineering, right? And then you're going to have to do constraint clustering. And let me get into some, some, some more details, but let me first talk about the pairwise distance computation. I mean, what you have here is you basically construct uh, a, a distance uh, metric. You can learn this metric, or you can define it based on background knowledge. It basically is going to take uh, two products, and you're going to construct these uh, representations based on all the data you have. So for example, you might take the title and convert it to a bag of words. Titles across retail uh, websites are not the same, not exact matches. So you have to be fairly smart about that. You might remove some stop words that don't really matter. For example, it's a good idea to remove the. But turns out the North Face is a brand. North Face is not a brand. The North Face is the brand, right? So you can't really remove it in all cases. That's tricky. But to cut a long story short, what you can do is you come up with a distance metric, or learn a distance metric that allows you to do, you know, to get a distance between the two products that you have in one of your groups. Right? Now, you could then, given that you have this distance metric, go ahead and just cluster these products. And then whatever works or whatever ends up in the same cluster is what has matched. Right? That's, that's a match. So you have done your blocking, you have used all your attributes, and you're, you're, you're good to go. The problem is, uh, it's, it's, there, there is an extra layer of complexity to it. Certain products just have to match. Certain products cannot match. When is this? Suppose I do have UPCs for products. I do have the MPN, the manufacturer part number for products. Let's say I have a product line for certain products. I'm going to have certain background information about these products that uh, I have to leverage in order to, I mean, I can't ignore this information. This information, A, allows me to do better. Second, it also allows me uh, to impose certain constraints. So for example, one product at a store can only match one product at a different store. This is the match at a store constraint. Now, it's possible that a duplicate product exists on the same store. Marketplaces are nightmares with this. But with these constraints and with a good distance measure, you can basically do you know, constraint clustering. And in its, it's, it's, it's fairly simple. What you're saying is, you start you know, bottom up, you start with uh, one product clusters, you keep merging them, and just make sure that your constraints are not violated. In the sense that these two things, if they have to be together, you just go ahead and merge them immediately. If they cannot be together, you prevent two clusters from merging. Right? So uh, that's, that's one of the ways to solve it. There are certain, you, know, you, you could improve the efficiency of this. But that's, that's the fundamental idea. But the key learning here is uh, just, just distance metric computation and clustering based on that uh, doesn't work. And you'll get absurd results, and they'll keep uh, you know, popping up all over the place. What you really need to do is constraint clustering. So that was an important learning. So now we have all our moving parts in one place, and we can you know, look at it, you know, step back a bit. You know, how does this thing work? So we start with a bunch of HTMLs, we parse them to get a product record, classify the products, extract the attributes, block and construct product groups, do match inference to get the matches. So that's, that's the flow, that's the data flow. And each of these blocks uh, you know, contribute to the final process of matching. Let me just talk a bit about how we go ahead and evaluate uh, this. I mean, it's pretty much standard precision and recall, uh, but you know there are there are a few nuances here. In the case of precision, if, given that you have a good spot checking budget, this is easy to do. You have a bunch of reported matches. You can go ahead and decide on what sample to take based on you know a confidence interval that you want and just send it for spot checking and get a, uh, you know, get a sense for how precise your matches are. 
You might want to do it at a customer level, at a site level, at a category level, at a leaf category level. You want to segment uh, this particular population of reported matches so that you are able to really find out where you are doing badly. Now, this is one of the big problems because what happens is if you just take one random sample from your entire set of reported matches and that number is high, that doesn't tell you how good you are doing with a paying customer. So you're going to have to sample his, sample his products or you know separately, right? That that's and his, I mean the, that particular customer and their competitors. So you, the, the key idea here is if you care about a certain segment, you got to sample from it. And then given uh, enough of a spot checking budget, a crowdsourcing budget, you might outsource it. You can get a very good sense of the precision. This is a good problem. I mean this the, this can be very easy to evaluate. It's it's not hard. Just throw money at it. The recall, on the other hand, is extremely hard to estimate. Why is this? This is a needle in the haystack problem, right? How many matches would I get if I did all pairs? There's no way to find out. The population of all pairs is so large, as I showed in the plot. If I go ahead and sample from this population, it's the population of matches is going to be extremely rare. So. Uh, th this is something that I'm trying to, you know, I mean, we, we're really trying to work on getting a good estimate of how many matches are really out there. Some of the ways that we have used is to, uh, to, to, to have people actually search for products on different sites where we expect them to be sold to put together a blind set, and then we compare our results against this blind set. Again, it's, it's, it's a very rudimentary approach, but it does allow us to get a sense for where we are recall-wise. The other thing that you might do is say that, I'm going to construct an envelope, an envelope of potential matches. So I'm going to say anything that is within a string, you know, a, a jacquard uh, similarity of uh, whatever, I'm going to consider it as a match. And I'm going to sample from that population and then you know, treat that as the bounding envelope. So a lot of uh, ideas here, but it still remains as a, a needle in the haystack kind of a problem, hard to estimate. Uh, but in general, I mean, people are taking pricing decisions on this, so they care more about precision. So I mean, we have that part uh, covered. So towards the end, I'll just uh, leave you with uh, you know, uh, one, one key learning, which is not that deep, is that in order to do all of this, you need to build the right set of tools, looking at your data, you know, annotating data, uh, looking at similar images. And we start doing this with you know, a little bit of scripts and a little bit of you know, Excel or whatever. And that just gets out of hand pretty quickly. You, you need this entire ecosystem of tools uh, in order to do the machine learning stuff right. right? So I guess over a period of time, we have built a lot of tooling around uh, being able to you know, download this data, being able to identify similar images, similar titles, uh, cluster them, so on and so forth, plus have people be able to uh, annotate this data, generate training data. So I would say tools matter. I mean, build, build them early on. I mean, because hey, the longer you uh, try to make do with uh, bad tools, it's, it's going to really impact your velocity. Again, it's a very trivial kind of a thing, but <laughs> in the long run, uh, it, it, it matters, matters a lot. Right? So that's pretty much it. I'll, uh, I'll leave you with uh, what Index does, and I'll take any questions you have. Uh, hello, a really nice talk. Uh, thank you. And uh, I'm right here. Oh, thank you. And a uh, couple of uh, uh, points. So you were mentioning that the feature engineering was really hard. 
So I was uh, wondering if uh, uh, back propagation was a way to identify using uh, some, uh, you know, deep learning algorithms. You know, they will do detect the features themselves. Is that an option for the first uh, problem, feature engineering? And also, one of your slides had something CRF. I didn't understand that. Conditional what is random fields. Oh, okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, so to answer your first question, um, I mean that's that's a very important question that I get asked uh, by my stakeholders on a day-to-day -day basis. Feature engineering constitutes somewhere between 30 to 50 percent of all our activities. The hope is that deep learning fundamentally replaces this step. I see this happening in the case of images really fast and really well. In the case of text, I'm sure it'll get there, but not, not that rapidly. Uh, but again, you know, things, things might change. But I, we, we have had really good experiences with uh, doing deep learning with images rather than uh, with, with, with text. Uh, hello. Uh, so, about the slide where you're matching products and you're comparing to each other based on their attributes. So, uh, what about something like, uh, uh, so suppose if there is a Nike shoe, you can always get the catalog and get group the products according to, like catalog from their official product listing website or something like that, and find the distance closest to that catalog and just group it accordingly. So, catalogs or crawling or getting data from manufacturers, A, I mean, they're not willing to share that data. They have current data, they don't have data that they'll share over you know, a long period of time. Secondly, the parsing becomes a more notorious problem. So it would be great if you had feeds for all of this, and if you were, were able to use these feeds, and uh, I guess we are gonna venture out into that. But in this particular form, uh, we were trying to solve the problem purely starting from HTML pages. Right? Uh but the thing is, uh, so that both come under different categorizations of data, right? So one is the meta, so that will be something like a, like the metadata. So that's like the product listing or the catalog, like you can treat it as a source of truth. And all the other things can be treated as something like transactional data or the data which is required for processing. So there can be other things for which can come under the metadata category as well, like a list of recognized brand names. So like you said, the North Face. Right. So th they can be, okay, these words are definitely recognized brand names if you have certain amounts of metadata. So do you d go with that? So like, uh, again, if you are Google, people will share this data with you willingly. If you are a small startup, they wouldn't. That's one reason. Second, uh, our entire line of data products around this product database is about competitive price intelligence. Why would a retailer Give me information. Retailers would never share information, right? Unless there are, you know, for, for some other reasons, they are customers or whatever. Uh, secondly, uh, manufacturers, again, have no incentive in sharing this information. They'll have it on their websites. Sure, that's because that drives sales for them. But, uh, I mean, I agree that in a sense it is an artificial problem in the sense that if you had that data, if you had good clean structured data, they, all, all this wouldn't be required. That's... Correct, but from a purely business standpoint, this data is very hard to pick, procure, and that is the whole reason why we do this the hard way, right? I mean, it's a business reason rather than a technical reason. So yes, every retailer and manufacturer, if you had access to all their data, this wouldn't be a problem. Thank you. Yes. How do you handle stuff like multi packs where price varies with the packaging? Do you index these separately? In that case, the UPC might be same across uh, products. So, do you uh, have you faced challenges, and how did you address those? That's a, that's a very good question. I'm, I'm sure you actually play with this data. That's why you asked that question. Uh, packs are notoriously hard. Packs, boxes, items. We have models that individually recognize these and put them into attributes. Um, so again, to give a context for everybody, a retailer will often take five pens, treat them as a single unit of sale, and then sell that.
right? The, the, the price of this is going to be, well, five times of the price of a single pen. But on, this, on the page, you're just going to have pack of five somewhere there. So we do attribute extraction for that, and that's how we solve the problem. And getting that attribute extraction step is critical. Uh, do you work around that? How do you work around that problem? So data around UPCs uh, is, is sanitized based on the, you know, the titles, the images that they will have, right? And once, I mean, there is a process of sanitization to UPCs. No piece of, the single, no single piece of data is uh, gospel, right? So you do have to sanitize that. But if you have a high level of confidence, then you can probably uh, use this data. So yes, in the sense that there have been enough and more cases wherein UPC data was bad, uh, but the way we uh, take care of that is we, we look at other pieces of information also, sanitize it separately. Uh, so next question is, is it done? Yeah. Hello. So next question is about category finding where uh, we are doing breadcrumb mapping. So that uh, uh, taxonomy building is uh, basically how we are uh, building that taxonomy. Okay, so uh, I guess I, uh, I mean, I would, I can point you to somebody's master's thesis out of IIT Madras who, who actually worked on this problem very recently. I guided him. So to to, to uh, give you a a a a, a very uh, small but uh, I mean a good answer to this, you start with taxonomies from multiple different places. You take you train classifiers for each of them, right? Then you take a product from one store and see what classification it got here. And you take the classification, you know, you, you take a product from here and predict based on that taxonomy. What that allows you to do is to construct a matrix wherein I have a category here and a category there. And then based on this kind of an analysis, you can build a richer taxonomy. So let me give you a very specific example. This is a very interesting problem. There is a site called Sweetwater which does, just does music instruments. Now their taxonomy when it comes to music instruments is way deeper than what Amazon has. So when I'm con constructing my master taxonomy, I want their entire tree to go sit right in the place where Amazon is. So this kind of an automated approach of training classifiers on each taxonomy, have them make predictions on other products, and then take a look at the breadcrumbs of how they align is the approach that you might use in order to construct this, uh, you know, this really large taxonomy. Again, it's not perfect. You still have to sample, spot check, validate. But that, that's, that's how we attack that problem. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, sorry. Um, so uh, I, I, I work at Lazada. Uh, we're part of our business. We're online retailer. Part of our business model is one of those marketplaces that you hate. Um, so and we don't do that to you on purpose, okay? This is the data that we get from our, our sellers. It's often dirty and messy. So we're going through the, actually the same exercises that you are trying to entity match all the data and recognize everything and get it nice and neat and orderly. Um, it was a great presentation, fantastic, thank you. Um, it's the sort of stuff that keeps me uh, awake at night thinking about. Um, so in the process that you're doing this, how often do you turn to um, manual people to QC this? So at some point, you're going to get some certain level of confidence that you're going to be able to push things into, yes, this is a match, or no, this isn't a match. Then you're going to have some middle ground. And you're going to have to spend some time with human people doing yes, no's. Okay. What, I mean, roughly what sure. percentage of the products fall into that? Okay. And, sure. and can you use that training data to actually improve results over time? So to answer your question, uh, we have segmented all our, our data, uh, or all the inferences that we draw from our data into segments based on how important they are. So if a customer is looking at a certain piece of data, uh, if they are a paying customer or a POC customer, that's the highest tier, right? If uh, they are a prospect, they're the next tier. 
then there are certain things that we care about from the point of view of scale if we want to, you know, for many different reasons. So basically, uh, we have broken our data down or broken our, uh, you know, the output of the process down uh, into these tiers. And each tier has a certain confidence, of interv a confidence interval that we want to operate at. Based on that interval, and based on the, you know, how, how, I mean, that basically represents how much we care about it, there is a frequency at which we sample, and there is a sample size that, that we take. So the resources that we have are distributed based on these tranches, and we are sampling and spot checking all the time. Because, uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's one of those things, especially when it comes to prices, yeah, we, we do it, uh, I mean, we are very paranoid about this. So, but I mean, can you give a rough estimate of how much effort you put in there? Is that, you know, one-tenth percent of the item, one percent, three percent? In terms of budgets, uh, I mean, are you asking that question in terms of budgets? Or, I mean, or in terms of uh, the, the number of items spot-checked? So typically for a 95% confidence interval with a 50-50 distribution with a margin of error of 5%, a sample size of around 700 is good enough. That's the number I remember on the top of my head. But then again, those are the three numbers. I mean, what is the underlying distribution, right? So if it is a rare population, that's a problem. What is the, my margin of error and what is my confidence interval? So we start with the margin of error and the confidence interval. We have a sense of the underlying distribution, and we let these two numbers guide it. So for example, uh, there are cases wherein we want to operate at a 99 confidence interval, and we want 2% errors. I, I think the, the number that was asked for was 97% accuracy. I don't know why it was 7 or 6, sorry, but whatever. There was a number that we need. I mean, that's an SLA, right? We need to meet that. So based on that, we do uh, you know, the sampling and the spot check. Sure. Yeah. Uh, hi. Uh, here. So mine is a follow-up question on what he asked, um, more uh, on the quality side of the whole process. Since we have a series of uh, uh, tasks that are uh, that have a chance of something going wrong somewhere. So I understand you have manual QC as part of every phase. How do you ensure? Have you also automated the whole quality process? How do you ensure that everything is just right to you know go ahead okay. with uh, further you know business uh, notes? Right. right. So I guess one of the parts of his question that I didn't answer would might answer yours. Every single model that we have is calibrated in the sense that it produces a probability. This is the single most important thing that you have to do in order to get this thing right. What the probability gives you is the ability to look at low, uh, you know, uh, predictions made at low confidence interval, uh, at, at a low confidence, uh, send it for spot checking, completely, uh, you know, remove them from your output, use that and have it annotated, use it as training data. For, so for every stage on a continuous basis, we have how many you know predictions were made with a low confidence, and this thing directly goes into you know, the, the crowdsourcing pool as such. right? So yes, this process is completely automated. Uh, all we have is, hey, there's an API. You submit it. It goes there. The number comes back. There is a dashboard. If that number is read, then I know I'm not getting sleep tonight. right? That, that kind of a thing. Right? So. Yeah. Um, please take all your other questions offline. Uh, thank you, Nikhil.